Hi there, my name is Dr. Yuri Burstyn and this is Mr. Pirate D. Cat. And I'd like to welcome you guys to this much requested, long awaited video on feline kidney disease. Now before we go on, please remember to like and subscribe, squish those buttons, pet the bell notification icon, and don't forget to share this video with anyone you know who has a cat, as well as your veterinarian, because they will all find it very helpful. So, cat kidney disease is probably the most important medical related video I'm gonna make because it is super common in cats. About 30% of cats develop kidney disease at some point in their life. And it's probably the most common of the three kind of big common old age diseases of cats. And of course, any species can get it. You know, I treat kidney disease in everything from cats to dogs to chameleons to snakes. And of course, humans can get kidney disease as well. And it's pretty similar across species. But in this video, we're gonna focus more or less on cats because, well, that is kind of the big disease of cats and this is kind of a cat channel. So what is kidney disease? There's many names for it. CRI, CRF, CKD, uh, but all of them really just mean that the kidneys gradually stop doing their job without any specific underlying disease process involved that is easily identified. So it's not like you get a kidney infection or kidney stones or cancer, it's just that you lose kidney function over time. And what kidneys do is kind of, well, they do a lot in your body, but to help you understand how we diagnose and manage kidney disease, you have to be aware of their main two functions of kidneys in the body. One is to conserve body water by filtering your blood and producing urine. And the kidneys reabsorb water, and, or rather plasma, back into the system. So when a kidney works well, you produce well-concentrated urine. And when a kidney does not work well, you produce dilute urine. Another function that kidneys have is clearing byproducts of metabolism. So what we do is we measure byproducts of protein metabolism specifically, and when they're elevated in the blood, we know they're not being filtered at an appropriate rate. And again, we know that the kidneys are usually the culprit. Of course, kidneys have a bunch of other functions in the body that are known by your doctor and compensated for, but you don't really need to worry about that. So the main two jobs of the kidney is conserve body water and filter out metabolic byproducts. And we use these uh, jobs to diagnose kidney disease because we do lab tests. This is why the American Association of Feline Practitioners recommends that blood work be done on cats pretty much every year after the age of eight. And what they mean by blood work is actually blood work and urinalysis, urine testing. So we do both at the same time because you need blood and urine from roughly the same time point in order to assess kidney function. And that's one of the big things we're looking for. And of course, cats over the age of eight or nine are statistically likely to start developing some of these old age cat diseases that we look for. And kidney disease is diagnosed by looking at a lab work and seeing dilute urine and elevated renal values, which are things that should be filtered by the kidneys but aren't being filtered. And the reason it's important to do regular blood work on your cat is because you can find these changes on the lab work years before the cat actually looks sick which is the ideal time to find them because if you diagnose this disease, like with almost any other disease, you diagnose it early, you start managing it, the patient might never even know that they're sick. Whereas, of course, if you wait till end stages when they're nine tenths dead, well, at that point, managing the disease is going to be an uphill battle. And just for your frame of reference, you know, cats can lose like two thirds of their kidney function before you see anything abnormal in the blood work. So it's not like you're really even getting that early diagnosis to begin with. Although there is a new biological marker called SDMA that is often measured on laboratory tests. It only came out a few years ago and it can pick up kidney dysfunction much earlier than previous testing. So maybe now we can pick it up, pick up kidney disease when like 50% of kidney function is missing roughly rather than 60, so a little bit earlier. But just so you know, you can often pick up kidney disease on labs much earlier than you pick up symptoms of it because often cats don't show clinical signs of kidney disease until they've lost like three quarters of their kidney function. So there's a huge gap there between when diagnosis is possible and when it's made if you only look at sick cats. 
And of course, like I mentioned before, the goal is to manage it early so the cat doesn't know that they are sick, which of course, which is what veterinary medicine is all about, maintaining quality of life for animals. So what will usually happen is your veterinarian looks at blood work they did on your cat and they'll see the urine, they'll see elevation in urea, creatinine, and maybe SDMA if they're checking it, and they'll say, oh, your cat has kidney disease or CRI or kidney insufficiency or whatever acronym they choose to use. Doesn't really matter, it's all the same disease. And what this is, is a gradual loss of function of the kidneys over time. So then the name of the game is preserve existing kidney function. And that is actually what uh, kidney disease therapy is built around. We eliminate any complications like kidney infections and other problems. And then we just manage the kidneys and we try to support their function. And this allows our patients to live a normal life despite the fact that their kidneys are not doing a great job. And again, for your frame of reference, you can live on like 5% of your kidney function. So just because your cat is sick and has kidney, elevated kidney values, it's not really the end of the world. There is a lot of room to play with and a lot of leeway to manage their disease and to give them a nice quality of life, often for years and years and years. So there's no need to panic, but there is a need to be proactive about catching these things early. And of course, if you're only diagnosing it in a cat who's really sick, then you are a little bit behind the eight ball. This is important because a cat with kidney disease will basically look like a normal cat, normal cat, normal cat. And then they have something called a ure uremic crisis. This is when their kidneys get overwhelmed, they get dehydrated, they get a kidney infection, they get a little kidney stone, and they have a uremic crisis, which is when they crash, when they lose half of their body weight, they're vomiting, they're ill, they look horrible, and sometimes that is when they're presented to the vet, when they're in a uremic crisis, which is obviously not ideal. And then you get them out of the uremic crisis, and the normal cat, normal cat, normal cat, uremic crisis, medical intervention, back to being a normal cat, normal cat, normal cat. And again, the goal of management is to just have the cat at your normal cat at all times, and keep them out of the uremic crises. But of course, that is not always possible, but it is very, very possible in the majority of cases. And just a small word about uremic crises. If you do have a cat who is vomiting, losing their body weight, you take them to the vet and the vet says, oh, your cat has kidney problems. This is a time for aggressive medical intervention because you gotta protect whatever kidney function they have left. You have no idea if they're living on 30% of their kidney function or 5% of their kidney function. We don't have kidney function tests that have that level of resolution. So don't stuff around, put them in hospital. Usually I tell my clients, three days in IV fluids. That is the right way to treat a cat in uremic crisis. You don't do subcutaneous fluids, you don't do fluids under the skin, you don't do outpatient management. Cats who do well with outpatient management, even though they're in a uremic crisis, do so despite the management, not because of it. So these cats go in hospital, they get intravenous fluids, they get rehydrated, they have their electrolyte balances corrected, and most of them will go home in two to three days with well-functioning kidneys at whatever base level they had, and they will do well long-term, whereas the cats who are managed as outpatients, they don't do as well long-term. I mean, even if they survive this particular uremic crisis, they probably suffer more permanent kidney damage than they needed to. So please be proactive if your cat actually has active, active issues and get them into hospital, get them overnight for a couple, like, couple days of intravenous fluid therapy. It makes a huge difference. Once a diagnosis of kidney disease is made on initial blood work and urine testing, there may be some follow-up tests that your vet will want to do. Now, patients with kidney disease will often have urinary tract infections because concentrated urine is one of the main defense mechanisms of the body against UTIs. And of course, with kidney disease, your urine is dilute and bacteria have an easier time of hanging out in the bladder and causing problems. The challenge is that often urinary tract infections are asymptomatic in animals, or at least they're occult, so we can't really tell the symptoms. So a cat can have a urinary tract infection and you will never know until it moves up into the kidneys. And then kidney infections you know, are pretty serious and then they have, these animals are quite symptomatic and usually that's, they'll end up at the vet eventually. Because of this, one of the tests veterinarians will often do when they first diagnose kidney disease is do a urine culture to look for urinary tract infections. They might also do something called urine protein creatinine ratio. They'll check your cat's blood pressure. So there's a lot of follow-up that goes on after the initial diagnosis, but the initial diagnosis can be made on that simple screening test. And then it's just figuring out the details and nuances of what's going on. Some feline specialists also recommend a kidney ultrasound as a part of the initial diagnosis. Now, I don't necessarily do this in every case, but the reason 
a kidney ultrasound might be recommended for your cat is because if the values are really high or if they're not responding to initial therapy, the ultrasound is done to check for kidney stones as well as renal lymphoma, which is a fairly common type of cancer in a cat. Uh, it can look just like chronic kidney disease, but it is obviously not chronic kidney disease. It's its own disease. And so the way you find that is with an ultrasound. Again, I know many feline specialists will just do this as a matter of course. Some people only do it if a cat doesn't respond to initial therapy, but it is a generally at some point a good idea. And just a quick word about renal lymphoma. It's actually not a terrible diagnosis. It's one of the more manageable cancers we see in cats. It does respond fairly well to medical therapy, so don't panic if that is what your cat has. You can probably still have very, very satisfying outcomes in, well, majority of cases. So once you've diagnosed your kidney disease, uh, your goal for management is to keep that cat hydrated, keep that cat eating, keep that cat's body weight stable, and keep them out of uremic crises. So how do we do this? Let's get into the talk that I usually have with my clients once I've made the diagnosis about what this diagnosis means to their cat and how to manage it. There's something called the International Renal Interest Society, which uh, has a scoring system for cat kidney disease. It goes iris score one to four and increasing severity. I generally don't find it that useful for clinical disease management, but it is useful for research. And what we know is that cats with iris scores one to three, so basically early to kind of moderate kidney disease, will often live a normal life if that's their condition and diagnosis. So survival times measured in many years for older cats pretty much live out a normal lifespan. The only time you really get a decrease in life expectancy with this diagnosis is if you diagnose a cat in iris stage four disease, meaning you're really late to the show, which is why I'll never tire of telling everyone to bring their cats in for regular blood and urine testing as they age, so that if they do get kidney disease, you diagnose it early, manage it early, and get normal survival times. There are three pillars to managing kidney disease. Two of them are really commonly accepted. The third one is less so, but should be, and they are food, hydration, and calcitriol. So let's talk about food first. The earliest studies on kidney disease and diet have been done using something called Hill's KD or Hill's kidney diet, and it demonstrated significant increase in survival time and reduction in frequency of uremic crises in cats who are fed a proper diet. And proper renal diet is one that's restricted in protein, sodium, phosphorus, there's a bunch of other stuff added. I don't really know what it is because I'm not a veterinary nutritionist and I don't need to because other people designed this diet for me. And what I know is that there's different levels of renal diets. There's stuff like KD and Royal Canon Renal, which is for advanced kidney disease. There's also senior cat and early renal diets from both of these companies that are for early kidney disease because of course cats are little obligate predators, obligate carnivores, they need a lot of protein to stay healthy so you don't want to restrict a cat in their protein intake too much too early because maintaining body weight is a big part of the battle in managing kidney disease in cats so you want to have a moderate protein restriction at early stages of kidney disease and a slightly more severe protein restriction at later stages of kidney disease. And neither you or I really need to know much more than that. You just need to pick the right food for the stage of kidney disease. So diet is very, very important. It is an absolute keystone to managing kidney disease. You have to get these cats on an appropriate renal diet for the life stage. That's all that I'm gonna say about that, but I'm gonna tell you that if you don't follow your vet's advice and put the cat on an appropriate renal diet, you're gonna not get a very good outcome. Now, this is a good time to touch base a little bit on wet versus dry food. Uh, and I'm just, all I'm gonna say was specific to older cats and kidney disease is that wet and dry food is essentially the same thing, just with a different moisture content. So dry food might have like a five to 10% moisture content. Wet food might have a 60 to 70% moisture content. And cats get most of their moisture, most of their body water from their food. You know, they're a little desert animal who might never have access to running water out in nature or have very limited access. So they're very good at extracting water out of their diet. And so dietary water content has a big impact on how well cats are hydrated. And I recommend feeding all older cats over the age of 10 wet diets only because a cat who eats wet food is always gonna be a little bit better hydrated and also a bit skinnier for those cats dealing with obesity later in life than a cat who only eats dry food. Of course, there's a little more nuance to it than that, but I always recommend cats over the age of 10, feed them wet food because if they develop kidney disease or some other health problem between vet visits or you know 
you might do blood work only once a year, what if they develop kidney disease a month later and don't get tested for another 11 months? Well, being well hydrated will protect them against any negative effects of it. The one exception to that is if you have a cat who simply will not eat wet food, then you might have to feed them dry food as you transition them onto a wet food diet or maybe use dry food to kind of sprinkle on top of the wet food to give them a few extra calories because of course dry food is a bit more calorically dense. And I would say that this is something we do if we have to, but we prefer to keep these guys on wet food only. As I already mentioned, maintaining body weight is really a big challenge in kidney cats. They often have poor appetites, they're often nauseous, or they might be losing protein in their urine. Again, remember I said there was other urine tests that were done by some vets in certain circumstances. So in some cases they're losing protein in their urine, which all leads to a decrease in body weight, loss of muscle mass, and negative clinical outcomes. So keeping these guys eating and maintaining their body weight is a huge part of the battle. And I always tell my clients that if you have a kidney cat who's put some weight, that's a huge win that needs to be celebrated. And of course, I do have videos on how to get your cat to eat new food made specifically with this in mind, uh, because kidney cats are, can be difficult to transition because they're often not feeling well, they're often older, might be really used to old food. So please check that video out and I will leave a link to it in the description below. So how to get a cat to eat new food. Another useful video you'll find on my channel that I will also link below is how to give a cat fluids under the skin, subcutaneous fluids, because that is another pillar of managing kidney disease. Now, if you get there early and you have a really early diagnosis, maybe you don't need to do this, but even from like mild to moderate stages of kidney disease, I start recommending that clients give their cat fluids under the skin at least a couple times a week, and it can often escalate to daily depending on the severity of the kidney dysfunction and, or as the disease progresses. I know this is a little bit intimidating for some of you and that is why I made that video and I just want to assure you guys that you know I have clients who are like 80 years old with arthritis in their fingers and can still give sub fluids. Most clients can give fluids to most cats. Now there will be some cats in which this is just not possible. That's a fact of life. Some cats are just a little difficult to deal with and I mean that's why I find working with cats so rewarding because treating an animal that wants to murder you is just a special kind of awesome. But most clients can give their cat subcutaneous fluids with a little bit of practice. You know it's like any skill. It's hard when you first start doing it and then it gets easy as you get good at it. The reason this is important is because one of the main symptoms of kidney disease is that cats drink more and pee more and so they're losing more water through their urine because their kidneys aren't concentrating the urine then they can take in and even though they seem to be drinking more they end up with a net dehydration so a net water deficit and subcutaneous fluids help correct that and also because subcutaneous fluids contain a bunch of electrolytes they also help correct electrolyte abnormalities that can develop when your kidneys aren't doing their job properly so subcutaneous fluids are a huge part of kidney disease management and will probably be done at some point during a cat's life now it's important to distinguish between intravenous fluids and subcutaneous. Subcutaneous fluids are for outpatient management, for cats who are stable, and to keep them out of uremic crisis. If your cat is in a uremic crisis, if they're not eating, if they're vomiting, if they're losing body weight, subcutaneous fluids are just pissing in the ocean, if you'll forgive my language. Then that cat needs IV fluids and hospitalization and a couple days of that, and then usually they will get back to normal. The third pillar of Kidney therapies may be a little bit less well established, so I just want to be honest about that. It is something that I use in every single kidney cat case I find, but is not used by all veterinarians yet because it's a relatively new intervention and unfortunately science takes a decade or two to penetrate the veterinary profession. And what I'm talking about is a medication called calcitriol. It's a medication that is kind of awesome because you only have to give it once every three days. It is very safe and has been shown in humans, in dogs, and in cats in reasonably well done studies to slow the progression of chronic kidney insufficiency. So it slows the progression of kidney disease and it also keeps your patient out of uremic crises and compensates for some of the problems that poorly functioning kidneys leave you with and it seems to work well in a multitude of species. Again, why is this not done by every vet in every kidney cat case? just a simple problem of knowledge penetration, just not everybody's heard of it. But the evidence is there and I use it in every case if it's well tolerated. Now the caveat there is that if you have calcium or phosphorus abnormalities, which are fairly common in kidney patients, you can't use this drug, which is why I always do a little blood test a couple weeks after starting it and why of course I always monitor all of my kidney patients with blood tests two or three times a year at least 
to make sure they're tolerating the treatments well and that their disease is stable and not progressing. And if it is progressing, we then we can make adjustments to it. So I mean, I guess that's pretty much the monitoring section of this video covered. You should do a, a health check on these cats at least twice a year, sometimes three or four times, depending on how well they're doing, and do some kind of blood work at least a couple times a year. Um, you know, sometimes you can do little spot checks for kidney function. Other times you do a you know, a broad spectrum panel to look at all sorts of stuff. And, you know, along with urine testing, that's up to your vet to decide. But definitely a couple times a year monitoring is what gets you the really, really good outcomes in these cases. So calcitriol, awesome drug, useful in majority of these cases, safe to use in majority of the cases, and I wish more vets knew about it. So diet, fluids, calcitriol. If you have a kidney cat, chances are you'll be doing two or three of those three things. Now, of course, there's other medications and interventions you can that some kidney patients will require. Uh, I call them treatment targets. So what I tell people is when we do blood work, when we do testing, we're looking for treatment targets because we know that if certain changes are present on the blood work, then we know that certain interventions will be useful. And this might be blood pressure medication for high blood pressure. This might be angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or a new drug called Symantra for protein loss. It could be antibiotics for you know, occult urinary tract infections. It could be a bunch of stuff. but. I'll let you and your vet figure that one out. Just know that there's a bunch of other stuff that could be done for some cats, whereas other cats don't really need much more than to stay hydrated, eat the right food, and get the calcitriol every three days. Of course, there will always be a certain amount of nuance and variation between patients in managing kidney disease, which is why, um, you know, you can't really manage a complex disease by YouTube video alone, but I really hope that watching this video will give you guys kind of a big picture of idea of what kidney disease is and how it's managed that you might not be able to get in like a 15 minute vet consult. And I really feel that it helps you, you know, the person whose little furry family member is, has a problem to understand the big picture understand why vets are doing what they are doing, then you can really be a part of the health team and really manage their health problem effectively. I think I'm gonna sign off there for now. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you guys really found this video both helpful and useful. And remember, these videos are designed to be consult room tools. So if you're a veterinarian watching, please feel free to recommend this video to your clients or show it to them in your consult room. Uh, it'll save you a lot of time, and this is what we do in my practice, is when I make these videos, we show them to our clients, and it saves us a lot of time repeating things that we would say five times a week anyways. And it also helps clients remember everything that the vet says in the consult room, because we know that people remember roughly 30% of what they hear at the doctor's office, because, you know, stress, and it's a lot of information. And having a video like this to refer to is really helpful, because then when you guys go home and you can't remember what your vet told you, you can just watch this. and. Uh, get a little reminder. So thanks again. Please remember to like, subscribe, share, pet the bell notification icon, squish your cat, squish all the stuff on your screen that you need squishing, and I hope you guys have a great day, and we'll see you next time.